And uh, so we welcome everybody who's joining us. We'll give everybody just a minute here to, to, to hop on and uh, uh, get going. So we're glad you were, stayed with us. If you want, say hello in chat while we're waiting here for a minute and let us know which institution you're with. So we're wel welcome everybody who's joining us today. So I think we're probably pretty much ready to go. So uh, again, welcome to everyone who joined us today. I'm Lisa Johnston. I'm the administrative coordinator for the Council of State Archivists. And I'm so pleased to have with us today uh, members of Ancestry staff and presenters for this shop talk on handwriting recognition. So with that, I'm going to go ahead. Um, MJ, can you move the slide forward? Just one. Thanks. So again, we're going to have a great presentation. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end and then a few brief announcements. So next slide. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to Craig Bullo from uh, Ancestry. Craig, take it away. Thank you, Lisa. We want to thank everyone who's joined us today. We appreciate COSA for putting on this shop, shop talk event. Um, we want to thank each of the COSA participants that are joining us, of course, and we recognize that you're coming from a variety of archives. Perhaps some of you are not connected to a state archives. We welcome you in, into this event, and we, we appreciate all that you do as archivists. Um, we, we hope that this presentation can give you an understanding of how handwriting recognition software is being used to solve complex problems when dealing with indexing records, particularly on how it is in, having a direct impact on ancestry as we look at some of our own methods of indexing now and in the future. Uh, for this reason, we're excited to introduce today's speaker, MJ Torbani. MJ is a principal and manager at Ancestry and an, and an adjunct or faculty member at Columbia University. His career has been focused on using artificial intelligence, AI, a topic we rarely hear about these days, right? Well, maybe if you're in some remote area of the Sahara Desert, otherwise AI is being talked about everywhere today. Additionally, MJ, MJ is also works, works with other emerging technologies to solve enterprise business problems. His team at Ancestry uses artificial intelligence and other state-of-the-art image processing techniques to process a variety of images with different form, languages, and record types. With that introduction, MJ, the time is yours. Thanks, Craig. Hi, everyone. Um, so let's get it started. We are gonna talk about handwriting recognition technology, the current status of it, uh, what do we think about the future of it, uh, some potential use cases at Ancestry uh, today that we are working on. Agenda-wise, I start by going over the technology itself, um, the AI and machine learning. As Craig said, this, there, you know, there are a lot of news and hype around it these days, uh, and we will talk about those. Uh, next, we jump into handwriting recognition technology, which we call it HWR at Ancestry. So if you hear me use the keyword HWR, that's what I mean. Um, and I go over multiple projects that we have been working on uh, and the challenges around them and how did we you know, handle different um, corner cases or unforeseen uh, situations that uh, we deal with daily as we pro process these uh, projects. Um, you know, at any time during this, during this presentation, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat. You can also speak up. I mean, I will be happy to answer them right away uh, as well. Um, let's get started. Uh, overall on AI, um, it has been a long journey and uh, it's not something, you know, that uh, it started five years ago or 10 years ago. It has been there since 1950s. Uh, and terminology wise, you might hear people use artificial intelligence. Some people say machine learning, some say deep learning. 
And some even use the keywords like GPT uh, that we hear about these days more often. Uh, I added this slide here to just give you a high level idea of what these uh, keywords uh, mean and how they are related to each other. Overall, when someone says AI, they are actually talking about machine learning and deep learning because these technologies are subcategories of AI. Machine learning is a subcategory of artificial intelligence and deep learning itself is a subcategory of machine learning and chat GPT and uh, other names you hear are subcategories of deep learning. Timeline wise, you hear since you see here that since 2010s, deep learning has becoming more and more popular. And uh, is probably the prominent technology today uh, with uh, most of the technologies that we use, like when you unlock your iPhone with your uh, face or when you go on Netflix and watch a show and it recommends the next best thing for you to watch or when you go on Amazon and it recommends what you should buy next. All of those are usually being done by deep learning right. technology. And uh, ChatGPT is again, another technology of uh, deep learning that is being used for processing text and uh, natural language. Overall, again, uh, on AI use cases and potential applications, we have machine learning, we have natural language processing, we have computer vision and we have robotic plus few uh, other domains, right? Uh, the reason I added this slide, I wanted to show you that, you know, AI can be used for many things. You know, you can use it to process images or videos or text, or you can use it for control, controlling the robots in a factory or so on. Uh, today, we mainly will talk about the application of AI in these two areas, computer vision and natural language processing, because those are the two technologies uh, that come handy when you talk about handwriting recognition. Okay, by the way, I will ch check the chat regularly. So if you have any questions, make sure to put it there uh, or speak up. This is slide. Now let's talk about this one. Uh, overall, you hear these days that uh, uh, there are a lot of concerns about AI ethics, AI uh, capabilities, and so on. Uh, let me walk you through this graph here uh, for a few uh, minutes, and then we can talk about uh, HWR use cases in detail. Handwriting recognition, as most of you know, has been a problem that AI and data scientists have been uh, trying to solve, right, since 2000s. Uh, and Overall, if this line, this vertical line that we see here is human level performance, right? Uh, AI was behind human level performance. It took it a very long time to reach to human level performance. And you can see around 2015 to 18-ish, you could claim on easier handwriting problems, uh, AI was meeting human level performance. Uh, but then you talk about other examples, like, for example, a speech recognition. Let me just enable uh, this PowerPoint functionality here. Let's see if it works. Yes. You can see on PowerPoint, for example, right now, I am using this speech recognition uh, technology that they have, right? Early 2000s, you could not, right? And you can see it uh, got better, got better, got better. And eventually around 2017, 18-ish, it got to human level performance again, right? Uh, and you can see as I speak now, it's perfectly transcribing my uh, speech and uh, it's doing the voice to text. Uh, I did experiment with, with this technology, you know, like three, four years ago, and it wasn't as good, right? But today, not only it can understand my accent or, uh, you know, any other accent that anyone might have, but also it can understand languages uh, like Japanese, Chinese, and translate them too. Uh, so you can see overall the trend of the technology, how long it took it to get to this uh, level of performance. On image recognition, it took it 
less number of years, let's say that. In 2010, it, uh, you know, people started to use AR for image recognition, like detecting cats and dogs and uh, stuff like that in images. And in a matter of seven, eight years, it reached human level performance. When you think about the next challenge, which was reading comprehension, it actually started to reach human level performance in the matter of like three, four years. With language understanding, the chat GPT is an example of it. It only took it three or four years to get to human level performance. Uh, and you know, the reason I show you this chart is that the next challenge you give AI, you don't expect the trend to be like this many, you know, it, you don't expect it to take years to get good uh, enough, like to, to get to the human level performance. You expect it to do something like this, even maybe this. The reason I say that is just because nowadays things that AI needs to get uh, better at different tasks, uh, you know, are there. Like it needs a lot of processing and a lot of memory. Those are getting cheaper. It needs a lot of data. And then we have a lot more data than we used to have. And all of those are only uh, going to let AI to get uh, better at this. And now let's go back to this handwriting technology uh, that is the topic of today's presentation. Um, and today I would say, you know, we are just juggling around this line. And, you know, in some areas, believe me, we see that it's actually beating human level performance. There are sometimes texts that come up and I look at them and I cannot read them. But when I look at what AI did, I can say, hey, yeah, this makes sense. It's doing it correctly. Um, okay, let me disable this. Um, MJ, we had a question. Is this sure. voice transcribing program within PowerPoint? Yes, you just go to presentation mode and click on this. It comes up. Uh, again, I mean, if you go to the presentation mode and click on this button right here, uh, maybe you don't see it because it's probably only visible to me. Uh, it's, it says CC uh, in the presenter mode, and you can just click on it and it transcribes the text for you. But any PowerPoint should have it these days. And we had someone ask, could you just leave it on? I think they're as fascinated by that as what you're actually going to of tell us course, about handwriting. Of course, I can totally do that. Um, so uh, I left it on. Now let's talk about uh, ancestry and uh, what do we do high level. There is a lot of content at ancestry that we need to process. and. Uh, once we process those contents, they uh, the content become available for our customers to use, right? They use it, for example, in uh, building their family trees. For example, Mary J. Hannon here might be, you know, in your family tree, we process a new content collection. It might be 1950 census. It might be French BMD. It might be Canadian census. But as we get this content and content and we process it using AI, if we see a mention of your name or one of your relatives or someone in your family tree, you know, we would hint you uh, that, hey, there is this um, case and uh, you will be notified about it. So what happens at Ancestry? We have a team that scans the content. And traditionally, this scan content would go to manual uh you know labor to uh key them so i would just say manual processing it used to be like that but uh over time we have been uh investing more and more in ai uh, and uh routing more and more content toward the ai engine to process it uh, rather than using the manual processing one. And usually this is faster, cheaper, and on par with uh, human level performance. We will discuss those two. Um, so why are we building uh, our own solution at Ancestry? Because of the reasons I just mentioned, you know, when you, 
uh, build an AI system to process this content, it really doesn't care if there is one image, 10 image, or 10 million image, right? Uh, all of them can go through this uh, AI engine to be processed in matter of, you know, um, processing an image might take a few milliseconds through AI rather than minutes or minutes, uh, the hours that it might take a human to do that. Uh, so the scalability and cost are one of the, of, of the top two reasons, quality, of course, and security as well, because now the data stays in-house and only our own AI algorithms see them. Uh, a variety of form types. So I think this is a topic that most of you know uh, about that. Uh, there are a variety of form types. I'm gonna show you a few examples. These are 1950 forms that you see on this image. Um, let me go to the next slide. These are French BMD uh, form types. Uh, again, uh, French, uh, we call them BMD, birth, marriage, and death. Uh, you can see that uh, the content here is different than the ones we see in the 1950. 1950 has a tabular format. You can see uh, the tables, uh, but something like French BMD is different. It has like paragraphs of text and some text on the margins as well. This is a Canadian census form. Uh, as some of you might know, 1931 Canadian census is going to be released in a few months, I guess, June. Uh, so these are some example empty form types that we have and are and we are using to train our AI algorithm so that it can process the Canadian census results. Um, high level, I am going to explain what happens uh, when we use AI for processing uh, handwriting uh, recognition uh, and process content. Step number one, we you know get the content. So at Ancestry, there are teams that would scan uh, the content and uh, give us some images, right? So we might get the images. And when we get the images, this is the AI pipeline. And it's always the same. Uh, I'm gonna show you how we always go through these three, uh, go through these three steps and uh, um, process the content. Step number one, we call it layout. And what does the layout do, do is uh, it detects the layout of a form. Like uh, if you remember, I showed you that French BMD is, for example, uh, a, a type of content that has many paragraphs. Uh, Canadian census is you know, a form with tables inside of it. Uh, 1950 census the same. It's a table with multiple you know, cells inside of it. Uh, so it detects the layout of the form and it says, hey, uh, after looking at the form, I think this is the structure of the form, right? Next, it goes to transcribing the content uh, in that layout. So transcription, it means that it looks at the handwriting, handwriting and then it gives us the digitized version of it. So that's what we call transcription. And at the end, you know, this step three is not always there, but sometimes is there. We call it NLP or natural language processing because for a case like uh, French BMD, there are paragraphs of text and pages of text. We need to extract names, uh, first names, last names, dates, addresses, and so on from the text, right? That is what this step of the process is about. So it extracts the entities and the records from the digitized and transcribed text. Uh, these are the three steps that we always uh, go through. Uh, and, you know, with every collection, we train the AI models to learn about the layout of that collection. And then we train the transcription uh, models to learn about the, um, you know, that language and how it should be transcribed. And if we need to, you know, read pages of text and extract records from it, then we use NLP. But sometimes with 
cases like 1950 or um, Canadian census, we don't need to do NLP because as soon as you transcribe a cell in that form, you know that's age, that's you know name or so on. Uh, you don't need to really use natural language processing for that. Uh, 1950 census. This is a project that we um, uh, did uh, about a year or two ago, and uh, I'm going to walk you through it high level with uh, 1950 census. What happened? We had the 1950 census forms. We would route them through the layout model. The layout model would give us something like this. It would say, hey, I understood this form. It is an, it's a tabular form. And these are the borders of the text and the cells of the tables in that form, right? So uh, exactly what you see here is an example that we um, you know, process through our pipeline. It gives us the dimensions of, of all the cells in that form. And 1950, you know, in the 1950, we had multiple form types, right? You know, sometimes some of the forms had, you know, uh, broad, um, larger comment sections. Some of them had shorter ones. So it wasn't just one form type. Like in the 1950 itself, you would see a variety of form types. And then once you this is once you do the layout, then you would send each cell. And by, by that I mean we would send only this cell to the transcription model and we'll transcribe it. Uh, or we will send this one, or we will send this cell or this cell individually. Uh, and uh, the transcription model would uh, transcribe those. You can see here, like if you would present it with something like this, it would transcribe it to this. If you, if you would send it something like this, it would transcribe it to this. And that's the transcription model that we had. And you can see here uh, that in the 1950, if we only had the layout model working well and the transcription model well, uh, then we would be good and done with that collection. Uh, it doesn't need an, uh, a natural language processing step in the Python. And I will show you another project that needs that. Um, okay. So uh, more examples, again, when you uh, send a form through 1950 census pipeline, uh, AI would tag different cells with different colors. You can see them here, you know, uh, it's a colorful uh, version of it. Uh, you can see this cell, this cell, all of them are uh, highlighted. And then individually, they will be sent to the transcription model to be, to transcribe those. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned uh, that in the 1950 census, we had different form types. You can see, for example, form type number one had like a bigger section for comment. Form type two, it had a smaller section, three, four, and form five even didn't have a comment section. Uh, and uh, we train the AI so that it can learn, hey, this is form type one, or this is form type two. Uh, and uh, when it sees, when, when the AI sees enough example of each form type, then it knows how to handle them. Um, and uh, overall, no matter which one of these form types you would send to AI, it would detect the layout correctly after some training. Uh, a little bit more details on 1950. You probably know that in the 1950, we had, you know, uh, uh, some more complications too, like there were checked boxes. We can see examples of checked boxes here. Um, and you would see examples of abbreviations. Uh, and we did build separate models. Like for example, we built a separate model that only looks at checked boxes and decides if something has been checked or not. Um, overall, on the results of the 1950 census, we uh, are comparing the 1940 census to 1950 census. 
The number of records and names, 132 million in 1940 versus 151 million in 1950 census. Number of images that we had in each collection. So in 1950, we had 3.8 million, but in 1950, we had 6.6 .6 million. It took us six months to process the 1940 census but it took us nine days to process the 1950 census. You can see all, although the number of images is almost doubled, the processing time is way shorter, only nine days to go uh, through, uh, to basically process all the images. And these nine days are not because it took AI nine days to process the content. Probably if you, have, if, if you would have done everything perfectly, it would have taken AI just a day or two to process all the content, but we had to work on, you know, some glitches in the system uh, that routes the images through different steps. And that's why it took nine days. Um, overall on the cost, it was, you know, a huge reduction in the cost. So processing, uh, although this was faster, the cost was, uh, um, a lot uh, lower compared to the 1940. And uh, the overall accuracy was 95% or plus uh, on the fields that we use AI to extract uh, them from the 1950 census images. Now, this is again a project that we used, uh, we processed uh, you know, about, about a year and a year, a year and a half ago. Um, but there are new projects that we are working on right now. Uh, I am going to go over those and show you uh, some uh, form types and challenges that we have with these projects. And uh, uh, right after that, I'm going to, to move toward uh, the final slides that we will discuss the future of HWR. French BMD. Um, so overall, content-wise, we have a lot of BMD type of content. Uh, and by BMD, again, I mean birth, marriage, and death. Uh, we have a lot of BMD collections for different countries. You know, fr uh, France is the first one, but we have uh, BMD content from different countries too. Uh, and it's a new type of content because it's not tabular. You can see examples of uh, BMD form types. Uh, so there is a paragraph uh, like this. Um, let me grab the tool to highlight. I mean, there is a paragraph of text like this one you can see here that you have to detect. Right, you would say, hey, this is one paragraph, this is the next paragraph, this is the next paragraph. This is a page I included just because you can see the quality of the page is not as great. There is some leak through from the other side of the page, but AI still was able to look at, the, at, look at it and say, hey, I know there is some leak through here and uh, the, I can ignore it. This is another paragraph. This is another paragraph here. And on this page, we have many paragraphs, right? But not only that, we had to, uh, you know, also label and uh, look at the borders, like this example here, this example, and here. Sometimes there's a title. And uh, it doesn't stop there. Next, we have to go and detect lines of the text. So you can see in each paragraph, there are lines of text that AI actually goes over those and detects it. Line by line, it will go over them and detect the line, right? This stuff that I'm explaining right now is the layout phase of the process. We would go over the form type and we detect the layout of the form, which say, here's the structure of the form. These are how many paragraphs are there. These are how many lines and how many margins are there. So we would detect all of these, right? That's the step number one of every process in French BMD. We have to do that too. 
so high level review of the process again with French BMD, we detect the layout uh, paragraph, and then we do the layout line level, and then we send it to the transcription model, which again is a French transcription model. It's not going to be an English tran uh, transcription model like the Canadian census, like, like the 1950 census. Um, so uh, these two steps of the process are the layout processing steps. You can see one is uh, step number one, paragraph level layout, step number one and a half. I, uh, we are doing the line level layout. And then once the layout is all figured out, you could send a portion of the layout, like for example, this to the transcription model and it would transcribe it to you. So you can see the transcribed version of the text here. But now if I ask you, you know, what's the name that is mentioned there? What is the date that is mentioned in this text? We don't know, right? We have to read this text and extract names and dates from it. Um, which we do that by sending the transcribed text here to our NLP model. Uh, Valerie, I see a question you have. How does AI differentiate between the text and the bleed true? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so, you know, I always think about AI um, this way. Like I would say AI is a kid. Right? You have to train the kid uh, how to do things, right? So in the case of AI, you know, uh, every time it doesn't do well on something, we show it more examples. Like with the case of Bleed True, this example, uh, initially it wasn't doing a good job on those. So we went and grabbed a good number of images that had Bleed True. And then we will say, hey, if I wanted to uh, extract paragraphs from this page that has blue true, this is how I would do it, right? So after showing AI like 300, 400 images and how we do the detection of paragraphs on those type of forms, it kind of matured enough. It wasn't a kid anymore. It was a teenager now, you know? Uh, and the more images you show it, it becomes more of an adult after some time and it does a much better job. Uh, so what helps to move this kid like from being so naive to someone that does a good job to someone that does a perfect job is just showing it more and more examples uh, of how to handle it. And then eventually it learns and can handle those by, by itself. Um, so I uh, hope that answers your question. Now let's go back to the French BMD. Uh, discussion after the transcribed text is uh, extracted, we need to go and uh, do the natural language processing step. What does the natural language processing step does is this. It says, hey, this is date. is 3rd of February. I am not French, so I cannot eat French. This is an event. I don't know what does me means in French. Again, a baptiz uh, a baptized event. And it extracts the names. It says it knows this is a name of someone, or this is the name of the someone, or this is the name. And uh, it knows that, for example, this name is son of this name. You can see this is a relationship, son of, born on, or related to, or... Uh, again, this person is son of this person. So you can see what, what I mean by natural language processing is extracting names, events, dates, and the association or relationships between them is what we should do in this step of the process. BMDs are a much more complex um, collection compared to Canadian census or any other census. Uh, but um, I think now AI is in a good uh, mature phase to process them and we are getting very good results so far um, with the initial testings that we have been doing on French BMD. Uh, 
Uh, I hope this is clear. Again, if I want to go back to one of the slides I showed you earlier, uh, this is slide that we always go through these three steps layout, which does uh, detect the structure of the form. Then after that, we transcribe the text. And then we, if we need to, we send it to a natural language processing pipeline that extracts records and dates and events and so on from the text. Um, and David, uh, let me read your question. What about records like old town books that record all types of records with no uniform formatting that we can build a template with? Can you? Um, old town books um, with no uniform formatting. That's interesting. I, I, I'm curious to know more about like, what do you mean by no uniform formatting? Like, are they, um, you know, paragraphs of text or their tables and so on? But overall, what we are doing is that uh, one way I would say, uh, David, that we can handle your case is that with every image, if we send it through the layout model to decide what is the layout of this page, right? Is it a page that has paragraphs? Is it a page that has tables? Or is it a page that has both, right? Uh, so AI is good enough to decide on that. And then if it sees it's a table, it knows that, hey, I'm dealing with a table now, and it sends it to the right few next models. Like, for example, if it's a table, we would use a different model or a different AI engine for it. But if it's a paragraph, we send it to a different AI engine, right? Uh, at the end, like one, uh, one point I want to mention is that we have many AI engines, right? Depending on the form type and the nuances in a form, we route uh, them to different models. Like, let me give you another example. For French, for Canadian census, right? You know, in Canada, uh, the census is done in English and French because of the French neighborhoods in uh, Canada, right? So the model now looks at the census forms and then if it sees English, it sends it to an AI that does good English. If it sees French, it sends it to an AI model that knows French, right? They are not the same models. I mean, they could be, but we prefer not to combine them because I mean, you could combine them into one AI model, but then it will be so big and huge. Uh, David, you can unmute if you want to go ahead and explain a little bit more about the type of town books, the records in your town books. Um, yeah, so the, the town books, which I've actually done research in, say from um, a New England town, uh, maybe going to the 18th, early 19th century, they would record all records just in the one book. And, you know, so on on one page at the beginning of it, there might be a, a list of taxpayers. And then yeah. on the bottom, there might be a marriage record. And then you turn the page and it could be the minutes of a town meeting and et cetera, et cetera. So it changes constantly it's free form it's it's you know different people recording it so i was just wondering you know would could ai actually deal with something like that and just read the text transcribe it or very good you... question david um, I, I got your point uh so i think in your case the layout should be you know Okay, because we can feed each page of that uh, book to the AI model and it would extract the layout of each page or the structure of each page. Then you would send it to the transcribe step, which I think would do a good job on transcribing the text too, no matter the language. Uh, now, the challenge would be in this step of the NLP because you, as you mentioned in a book, you might have a name of someone mentioned in page one and then suddenly you refer to that name in page 50, right? Or, you know, some something might be in the bottom of page one, and then again in page five, we refer to it. Or the relationships you can see here are, you know, all in one paragraph that I'm highlighting, right? But in the case of a book, it's a different story because, you know, you mention a date and then you go multiple pages and talk about something and, you know, AI today, I mean, AI last year wasn't able to do that, but AI this year can do that because the memory of AI has been, you know, um, the memory is becoming cheaper. So today we can give AI more memory. So if you are in page 50, it still remembers what was in page one, right? 
And we are doing examples like that for family history books, which are books again, right? Uh, but they go uh, multiple pages. It's more challenging compared to something like French BMD that all the events are mentioned on one paragraph, uh, but uh, it's definitely an interesting project uh, that AI does a decent job on, not as well as this example, like French BMD. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, uh, now, you know, I, I talked to you about the other project that we are actively working on because in a month or two, we will be getting the Canadian Census Collection. Again, a very straightforward project. Uh, I think just because of the 1950, we know how to handle the forms, uh, census-like forms. Uh, there are only 10.5 million names and 230,000 images, and images will be released on June 1st. So uh, again, if the 1950 took nine days, we expect to be able to process this in a day or two or three max, um, just because uh, the models that we built for 1950 could be actually used for processing Canadian census. You just have to tweak them a little bit uh, so they know uh, how to process this one. Um, what's next? Um, so, so far we talked about the, what is AI? Uh, we talked about 1950 census. We talked about some other projects that we are working on today and are not the same as 1950, like yeah, uh, they are different form types and the nature of the problem is a little bit different. Uh, and as we process different collections that has, you know, different collections that have their own complications and their own form types and nuances, uh, we have been thinking about, you know, the future of HWR and uh, how it would look like. Uh, and I'm gonna present that to you in the next uh, few slides. So the future, we think about it this way, that we will have a variety of uh, models that can process different type of documents pre-built. We would, if you're naming this uh, future plug and play, and I tell you why we name it plug and play in a bit, but the idea is anyone, uh, even someone without any education on AI or computer science should be able to use this platform. They would go grab a model off the shelf and then run their images through it and see how the AI performs on it. Um, what does this mean? I mean, the idea is that, you know, we want to make sure that not only, we already know that this is faster than manual processing, usually it's cheaper too, but can we make it available to everyone? Uh, I mean, initially at Ancestry so that everyone can use it. Uh, and that would allow us to, you know, do more indexing, process more countries, even look at more record types and uh, so on. This is the idea of uh, our plug and play platform. And I'm gonna walk you through it uh, in the next few minutes. So, we have a concept called model store where we have a ton of models available. And it's a store, like the same as your iPhone has an app store, right? Uh, on, on it, you can see there are a ton of models available. Like this one is layout for tabular forms. This one is layout for forms that have paragraphs. Or this one is a layout for content that has paragraphs plus tables plus lists, right? Uh, and plus many other other layout models. Then we have models that can transcribe, like it can they can transcribe English, they can transcribe French, they can transcribe Spanish, or so on, right? A collection of transcription tra transcription models, and then we have a collection of BMD models, right? Uh, uh, that can you know process text and extract birth, marriage, death out of text. NLP models. They we have NLP models that can extract locations or so on. So right now, this is the plan. And the idea is, let's say tomorrow you get a new collection uh, such as 1950 census, 
right? So you know 1950 census has a tabular structure. So you grab this model that is tabular, drag it and drop it here. Then you know the 1950 census is English. So you would extra, you know, grab this English model and drop it here. And then you have your 1950 census workflow already. You run the images through it. They go through the layout detection. They go through the transcription. And then you get your forms ready in a digitized format, right? And you get the performance numbers and accuracies too. Like you say, hey, per name, it's 99% accurate. Per occupation, it is, uh, you know, 65% um, accurate. So you get an idea of how accurate it is on different uh, parts of your form. And then tomorrow you get another collection uh, such as French BMD, you look at those and you see that they have a lot of paragraphs. So instead of grabbing this tabular one, you grab this paragraph model, drop it here. You know your language is French, so you grab the French model, drop it here. But you are not done. Now you need to extract birth and marriage and death records too, because it's not tabular. You have pure you know, the paragraphs of text to extract records from. So you drag and drop an NLP model too, because you need one in this case. And then you run your images through it, and it would get you the accuracies uh, there. So uh, let me uh, read uh, a question from Caitlin. Uh, are, AI, are AI better at reading older handwriting than people or just faster? Can they be used to help uh, decipher text that the person might be just uh, making an educated guess at? Yes, yes. I mean, Ketan, exactly that happens to me. Sometimes I see something and I cannot read it. I mean, I can guess some characters in it, but I cannot read it, right? Uh, and AI does a better job than me on reading those. Uh, and the reason I would say that can happen, Caitlin, is this, because uh, when I am reading a text, right? So my brain is looking at the, the, that handwriting and uh, trying to detect the characters. But AI is more powerful because, you know, it has seen examples of how different people would transcribe text, right? Uh, like the, when we, uh, for example, processing French BMD, we grab a portion of those French BMD images and we go manually uh, transcribe them by French experts, right? And AI looks at those and learns, right? AI looks at, you know, how different 10 French people transcribed those texts. But I don't look at that, you know, as a person, I just know how to read, you know, with my own style, but AI is looking at more people's uh, styles. And for that reason, sometimes it does a better job at transcribing stuff than we do. And it has surprised me in multiple occasions, you know, where I could not read it, uh, but uh, AI could. Um, glad that makes sense. So overall, the direction that we are moving toward is this. We are going toward this plug and play platform that allows people to drag and drop different models that they think best fits for their use case and run it and look at the final results and uh, you know start to use them. Um, and that doesn't involve, you know, people, that doesn't mean that people that are doing this have to have any technical knowledge. They just can, you know, be users of this platform. Uh, I briefly go to the previous slide that I uh, skipped through when I was uh, going through this slide. So that previous slide, we talk about how actually we are building this model store. Right. The job of my team is to prepare this model store. Basically, prepare a store that has a bunch of models available that different people in the uh, company ancestry can use. Right. Um, and how do we do that? This is the way we do it. Um, let me clear. So, when a new collection comes and we want to process it, right? Um, this is what happens. Let's say this in this case, I go again with 
maybe this time I go with Portugal BMD, right? So if we get a BMD collection from Portugal, what happens first, we grab some data for labeling. What I mean that, I mean, we grab a portion of that collection and we just send it to manual processing and manual uh, king, we call it, for people to prepare some Im images so that AI can learn from, right? So that's what we do. And then we send it for data labeling. Then the data is labeled. We show it to the AI. AI usually now looks at how people are you know, doing different things in that collection, layout, transcription, or NLP. And then once we are happy with the model, we send it to this model store that we just talked about in the other store. So we plan to have um, about 25 uh, models in that model store by 2025. Uh, today we have about you know uh, four to five models added to it, but uh, right now our plan is to intensively work on this and uh, build a model store that has majority of the stuff that people in our content team might need. Um, and uh, there's a question: Is there a handout? I am not pretty sure. I think uh, maybe um, Lisa knows that. But I'm done with the presentation. Thank you so much for listening to me for 45 minutes, an hour, and uh, I hope I didn't talk too much. I'm gonna stay here and answer any questions you might have. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation. Thank you, MJ. Um, to answer your question um, about handouts, we will have a recording of this webinar available on the COSA YouTube channel. It usually takes us you know, a day or two for us to get it up there and load it and stuff, but that'll be available. So if you want to um, see it again uh, and see some of the images from there, that would be the best way to do it. So um, questions. Anybody have any questions? We've had some really great questions so far. And so while you're, if you'd like to ask them, uh, you're, you're welcome to either type them in chat or uh, raise your hand and we'll let you unmute and uh, you can ask them directly. Um, I've got one, MJ, while we're waiting. Is it mm -hmm. cheaper to build a solution in-house or to use a service? Um, that's a great question. Uh... Lisa, I think nowadays, uh, you know, um, uh, the price of data scientists or people who have people who know AI is increasing over time. And uh, the other thing I would always emphasize is that although we talk about building these models and adding them to the model store, it's not like you build it and you're done, right? It's an you know it's an always improving um, kind of process. Like always, the models have to get better. Like if a new form type or a new image shows up, you have to have people that go and train AI on those new uh, images or new cases that you think AI is not doing good. So it's an effort that is always ongoing. And for those reasons, I think it's usually cheaper if people outsource this kind of stuff. And um, you know use the models that are already available rather than building them and maintaining them, which is very costly. Okay, well, Caitlin also asked, she says, going off of Lisa's question, what should you look for if selecting a service? Um, I would say uh, what I would do is just, I would um, share a um, number of, different form types that we have or collect, you know, and content that we want to be processed with that service and see how they do, what kind of job they do on it, right? So that's the best way of testing a service because there are a ton of services out there available today, but not all of them, you know, uh, are great. So uh, testing them with an actual, uh, set of images would be my best suggestion. Okay, um, we have a question from Paula Perkins. Paula, uh, you're welcome to unmute if you'd like to ask it, otherwise we can read it. Uh, yes, I would, thank you, MJ. This is very interesting. I'm, 
I love technology and I'm a website developer for uh, from former my former job in a university library, um, even though that wasn't exactly the department I worked in, but I love all this. And But my question is, uh, how are corrections made when archivists or individuals discover that during the process, maybe like when it's put up on Ancestry for individuals to use or, or re historians or researchers, that there's um, the process, there's a misinformation, it's misread yeah. just like the closed caption. Sometimes yeah. because of our different accents, it misreads something. How is that addressed and corrected? Because I've heard things from individuals like, you know this because you know most of the general public doesn't understand all this technology that y'all do and i do so how is that handled when that happens then thank you great question great question so i didn't mention this in the presentation but what happens when we process a collection with ai right let's say there are um, 100 million images right that we are processing with ai and, and then when AI processes them, like before we publish the result, like, right, we, we grab a portion of it, like let's say a million of that hundred million. And then we will have some people to look at the results of AI and review it, right? Uh, when they review, we usually ask them to highlight where AI is making a mistake, right? Because again, we all make mistakes. AI makes mistakes too. Uh, so uh, before the results are published, after we review the results of AI, and then we show AI where it made mistakes, and it actually learns pretty well from its mistakes. It will go back and it would try to learn from the mistakes and correct them. Again, AI just learns from data, right? So it might be initially whatever data you provide to it, or any feedback you have for it, it would just keep learning and improve it, uh, improving from uh, the feedbacks. Thank you. I totally understand that. <laughs> Thank you. What a great question. That was a great question. Do we have any more questions for MJ today? That was a lot. We appreciate your time, MJ, in explaining all of this to us and sharing the fascinating uh, new world that we have coming uh, or that's here and is moving forward. Uh, and we appreciate Ancestry's uh, support for COSA and sharing this with us. Uh, this is a great uh, way to look at what's going on. So thank you so much for that. Um, if we don't have any more questions, uh, I just like to remind everyone that um, we have more great webinars in the COSA lineup. We have one at the uh, at the end of the month. Uh, it's a two-parter. We're going to talk about building and remodeling archives, and this first one will be on the planning process. So uh, go to our website, and uh, we will, and you can register for that. We also have a great one from our electronic records series uh, on. Um, litigation and records holds. And that's gonna be, I think, next Tuesday. So again, there's all kinds of wonderful webinars available on our website. Uh, we appreciate all of your support. Thank you so much, MJ. Thank you so much, Craig. We appreciate all of your uh, contribution to this. And we thank you for spending time with us today. We hope we'll see you at the next COSA webinar or uh, COSA Shop Talk. And we appreciate all of you coming today. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.